Live from the PIX11 Social Media Center, she's got more than 30 years on the streets as an investigative reporter. Now, PIX11's Mary Murphy takes you deep into the world of cold cases, terrorism, America's drug crisis, and more. These are the Mary Murphy Files. Good evening and thank you for joining the Mary Murphy Files on PIX11 Facebook Live. Literally in the last hour, I just got back from the Bronx and I was there with Emmett. He's a community advocate who has been following the Junior case with me from the beginning since last June 20th when Lissandro Junior Guzman Feliz was killed outside that bodega on East 183rd Street in the Bronx. There was pre-trial testimony today. We didn't expect it. We waited more than six hours for the courtroom door to open and there were bombshells. Let me show you some video of one of those bombshells. It concerns this suspect, Diego Suera. He is the alleged leader of a Trinitarios set that purportedly went after Junior, mistakenly believing that he was part of a rival crew. He was charged with murder in the second degree, and he is not going to be on trial in the first case. But he was known as Witness C at the test at the testimony today, Correct. and I was able to confirm through a law enforcement source that witness C is Diego Suero. Here's the bombshell. The detective who testified from the Bronx Homicide Squad, Oscar Rosa, he said that witness C pretty much identified all the suspects in the stabbing of Junior, yes. the five guys that had the knives and the machete, and uh, he also identified nine others who were allegedly part of this meeting that took place before and after Junior was killed last June 20th. Let me show you uh, photographs I took in court today of the five suspects who were supposed to go on trial in this first case. These are the guys accused of actually setting upon Junior on the sidewalk outside the bodega. Uh, some of them covered their faces. Two of them actually did not. Uh, one of them has a very long name. I'm going to read it to you. Uh, Antonio Rodriguez Hernandez Santiago wearing black rimmed glasses now. Uh, he looks quite different from when he was first arrested. I have footage of Junior's mother in the hallway entering court today. And the reason I'm mentioning her now is because there was some kind of an outburst during the hearing. Junior's mother, Leandra, got upset. Uh, she thought that this guy Antonio Rodriguez Hernandez Santiago was looking back at her and she started cursing at him. She just spoke to me on the phone literally two minutes ago and she said she cursed him and that she voluntarily left the courtroom because she was so upset seeing him looking back toward the spectators and she came with some police escorts today as she always does. Junior's older brother Manny was there and other neighbors and what was your feeling about what happened in court today? Very surprising. Um, a lot of things came out that I didn't expect to come out so early, mm -hmm. um, but definitely an eye-opener and looking forward to the next court date. Well, let me give a quote, and I'm going to show the video again of Diego Suero, because that, that was really the biggest testimony that came out today. And we were the only TV station actually present in court when this testimony happened. And the Detective Rosa said, he explained to me he was the head guy, the boss, he was the leader of the Shure sect. Now that's the sect that's accused of going after Junior mistakenly. So Rosa said that he was just talking to um, Suero in the 48th Precinct squad and he basically was sort of identifying all these different people that have been accused in the case. I'm going to, to mention about uh, some of the suspects that he allegedly spoke about. He said of Elvin Garcia, that he was present for the assault, he was wearing a cover across his face, he had a slight cut across the back of his head. Are you showing Elvin Garcia now? I, yes, we are. Now, this was significant too. The same detective testified that Elvin Garcia went to a police precinct, the 34th precinct in Manhattan, right. the night of the junior murder, and was trying to file a report saying that he had been hurt right. in some kind of a fight in Washington Heights different borough from the Bronx. And my feeling is what the prosecutors are trying to show is that Elvin Garcia may have been trying to set up an alibi for where he was that night. Right, absolutely. And But then Suero said, well, you know what? He came to my apartment on Boston Road before and after the murder. So I was shocked. I found it to be stunning, yeah. the testimony. Uh, I thought maybe he was cooperating with the DA, but I was told very quickly when I when I called a source, no, he's not really cooperating. 
he made statements, and these statements they're trying to put into the trial. Once the trial begins, it turns out April 5th, we're now hearing, is the start date. Or the 15th. 5th or the 15th. 15th. Okay, but it's April. Right. And what's interesting about pretrial hearings, a lot of people don't think they're necessarily significant. But I know that more than 20 years ago, I covered some in some of the big cases like Howard Beach and the Steinberg case. Sometimes really important information comes out before the trial. So that's why I hung in there today with no, you. Today was definitely and because we definitely heard a lot more than we expected to hear. Uh, we have the mother in the hallway, Leandra. Um, I had spoken to her during this six hour wait for the hearing, and I asked her what she thought of no trial yet. It was nine months since this happened, and here, and there's a gag order in the case. So prosecutors, defense attorneys, anyone associated closely with the case are not supposed to speak. But I did get a quick question to Leandra Felice, Jr.'s mother. Here it is. Ms. Felice, it's taken nine months. Your thoughts on the trial not starting yet? No, we're here waiting. I need justice for Junior, and I want everybody to come together and supporting me, and thank you, and God bless you, all of you. Please, okay, hear me. So she can say anything else. Because of the, 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 yeah, the judge pro, pro. So there you have it. Someone pulled Leandra, Junior's mother, away when I tried to ask a question. She spoke briefly, but she couldn't really say too much about the case. But as we just reported a few minutes ago, uh, she cursed at someone in court, and I'm going to show him again because uh, there was some testimony very interesting concerning this defendant, uh, Antonio Rodriguez Hernandez Santiago. The first detective who testified was Detective Joseph Parchin. He's from the Bronx Warrant Squad, and he said that he went to New Jersey to the Patterson Police Precinct on June 24th, where there were six suspects that were picked up from a hideout, an right. alleged hideout of the Trinitarios. And he said he encountered this guy, Antonio Rodriguez Hernandez Santiago, who was handcuffed near a desk. He said, I have to bring you somewhere. What he claims is that this suspect kept saying, and here's the quote from the detective, he just kept saying, I'm a real Dominican, I'm a real Dominican, while puffing up his chest at me like he wasn't scared, like I am who I am. And then what came out in cross-examination by the defense attorney who was representing this suspect, uh, she said to the detective, oh, was it like a bird who was mating that he was puffing out his chest? And the detective quick bat, I don't believe he wanted to mate with me, ma'am. And I know that there were some snickers when that happened. What did yeah. you think of that testimony? I thought the question was a little absurd. Um, you know, um, he did his best to describe what puffing his chest out mean while being in handcuffs, which to me means more of a sense of like saying, I'm a, I'm a Dominican, I'm a Dominican, you know. You know, not being scared, just, you know, um, I just thought it was wild. It was, it was, it was, it was, it was, it was a little hectic in the beginning. Um, but it all, um, it, it was all, certainly worth waiting for in terms of the information that came out. Right. And there's such huge interest in this case, not only in New York, but in the Dominican Republic and around the world. Yes. I mean, we have so many people watching right now, more than normally would watch this broadcast. There is the victim who was only 15 years old when he was killed last June, Lissandro Jr. Guzman Feliz. He should have been going into his junior year of high school. And, uh, you know, we were first to show some of the chase that happened. Yeah. We, we got access to some of that video that showed the last block and a half of the chase, which actually went on for five blocks, so terrible that Jr. literally ran out of his sandals. Yeah. When he got to the bodega and jumped over the counter, uh, he had no shoes on. Um, I'm looking at what people are writing, and you know, Michigan people are watching from Michigan. They're saying about some of the suspects, he will get his. So sad. Rest in peace. You know, I, I've said in the past that the people from overseas in places like the Netherlands and South Africa and New Zealand and Paris who have written to me, what they always talk about is that it seemed that no one in the bodega really wanted to help Junior even after he came in with that lethal neck wound, and they kind of just waved him off, including a customer who has bags of potato chips in his hand and a Coke. Yeah. He wanted to just pay for his items. So the people overseas were really taken by that aspect of the case. But I think in New York, it kind of forced us to really confront the gang problems that we've had. What would you say to that, well, Emmett? Uh, to me, in, in terms of the store, they was given a second chance. Maybe the first time it was a little, he was a little startled and they didn't know how to handle the situation. 
but the second time around when they had a second chance to actually save his life, it was actually the customer who first pointed to the hospital. Mm -hmm. And then everybody kind of followed suit, say, yeah, yeah, go to the hospital, go to the hospital. But in all actuality, that could have been the moment they could have saved his life. Yeah, and, and you know, he collapsed by the security booth at St. Barnabas Hospital. And his mom works in that hospital. She worked in the housekeeping division of the intensive care unit where she had seen other young people from that area, especially from Adam's Place, right. coming in with gunshot wounds and knife wounds. And she was warning her son not to go near Adam's Place. And apparently Junior was very close to Adam's Place, only a few blocks from his home, when this chase began. Well, I just think he was a young man that was just making friends. Mm -hmm. You know, growing up, you know, sometimes you're a little, sometimes you, you know, around your neighborhood, especially he's been living there all his life, you know, just making friends and meeting people. Don't I, yeah, I want to read some more um, quotes and posts from people on Facebook. Kelly Biggs Wyatt, thank you, Mary, for continuing your commitment to Junior and his family. Justice for Junior. Uh, Katina Yamira saying, I pray daily for his family. And then Tonza Lester writing, you will get justice, Junior. Um, Shereta Leandri said, so many comments. What's with this gag thing? You know, so, you know, uh, some people are upset about the gag order that's been imposed. What do you think about that, Emmett? Um, well, I mean, sometimes people could take certain things and, and run with it and, and change it up. I, I think the gag order, in a sense, is a good thing. You know, eventually, you know, those who do go to court, the information does come out eventually. You know, the gag order is just people doing a little bit too much talking. And I think that there have to be some sort of a, some sort of something put in place to where we can limit the amount of pre-trial information coming, yeah, out. That's coming out. I mean, there's been an amazing amount, massive amount of pre-trial publicity and dozens and dozens of Instagram sites. You have an Instagram site, Facebook yeah. pages. Yeah. So really more pre-trial publicity than I recall in a recent case. I mean, the support is also overwhelming. And um, today it was a big turnout. We had a lot of guardian angels there. We had a lot of junior supporters there. So it was a great turnout. Um, and, very emotional. Well, it's the first testimony we've yeah. actually heard. We have not heard anything formally from the police in court until today. And that's why it was remarkable the amount of information that came out. Um, witness C, did you immediately know it was? No, here's the funny thing. I want to... One of the viewers is posting, did Michael Sosa Reyes show up? That is the guy who was captured on camera storming into the bodega with right. the other guys. And, you know, I reported early on he's a cooperating witness. So all of this testimony I'm hearing from the detective, I'm thinking it's Sosa Reyes. Absolutely. And then at the end, when the detective said, witness C announced that he was the head of this particular set, of the Shores, I'm like, that's not Sosa Reyes. Absolutely. And then he also said it was my house they came to on Boston Road. I said, that's not Sosa Reyes. And I figured it out that it was the alleged leader of the Shores set, uh, Diego Suero, who's charged with murder too. And so I called the source as soon as I could get out of the courtroom. And I said, is witness C Diego Suero? And I was told yes. So did you figure it out? Eventually I did. Once they did say the head of, before that, I thought it was someone else. Right. And um, it, it was almost like it was confirmed, not just, you know, with the address. Right, Boston and also, Road. Yeah, right, and then him being the head of. Right. Confirmed that it definitely wasn't who I thought it was, but it was Diego Suero. Diego Suero was in the precinct after at least eight other guys had been arrested, say, in the first week. Right. He was arrested sort of in the second week. So it's interesting that he was giving up all these IDs of people that some of them were already in custody. And I'm wondering if he thought he was going to save himself by just identifying everyone and confirming they were at this meeting. I'm wondering if he thought that because he wasn't physically at the site where Junior was killed that he wouldn't be liable. Oh, well, well, he gave up nicknames as well. So that even confirmed. Right. In fact, I should uh, talk about that. I'm glad you brought that up. Um, well, we know with Jose Muniz, I, I basically I don't have a solo shot of him today, but he's in court if you want to show the suspects pictures again from court, the still photos that I took. Uh, Jose Muniz was probably the second guy in. His nickname was Canalito. And I'm looking for some of the other uh, nicknames. One of them was Pio, was his nickname. And do you remember any of the other ones? 
Um, no, I mean, there was so much that came out. I have another one here. This is interesting. The guy that was allegedly puffing out his chest, uh, Antonio Rodriguez Hernandez Santiago. We've shown him before. We can show him again his picture. What was testified today was that his nickname was Walfanito. And, and, and that's what the Detective Rosa testified to. P.O. was the nickname for Jonakai Martinez Estrella. Um, and apparently, Suero said he was wearing a red shirt and a baseball cap that night, but then he changed into a white shirt. Mm -hmm. And what's, you know, been talked about before, what I've reported before, is that he allegedly plunged the lethal knife wound into Junior in his neck, the one that you could see so vividly in those videos, which were not playing. I, Junior's mother has said to me, you know, if you could limit showing the dragging. You called me up about that yeah. after one of the webcasts that we did. Yeah, that's appreciated, though. Thank you. Yeah, I mean, we're not showing it today. It, it'll probably be talked about at the trial. Yeah. But there, there, there were so many stunning developments today that it wasn't necessary to show footage like that. Um, but let's show Junior again. We have the photos of him. I think the first photo, he's wearing his burgundy uniform from school. He went to one of those medical art schools in the Bronx. It was a charter school. I know his mother was so happy that he got in there. Yeah. And I had done a story at the school in the beginning of the school year and talked to the dean and some of his teachers and the coach, Coach G. And they just said he was always full of life and a smile and did well in school yeah. and, and just so sad. Just a young kid growing up. How have things been in the Bronx since this happened? It's nine months now, just over nine months. I mean, I mean, as far as news, I've seen a lot. I haven't seen that it gotten any better, unfortunately. As far as news, um, I just see a lot more, a lot more stabbings, killings. You know. You see, I know it quieted down for a while. You know, this happened June twentieth, and I know for at least a month things quieted down. Yeah, for But a things have picked up a little bit recently. Yeah. There were some cases. I mean, I feel like things are going a little backwards. From the way the Bronx used to be, unfortunately, um, it was a point when it was when it seemed like it was getting better. Right. But you know, I mean, hopefully, um, with this trial, with this case, there can be an example set, and um, you know, things things can, in a sense, like stop stop happening. You know, the killings and the it's just not necessary. It's unnecessary. Um. Now, the governor had pumped in money into the Bronx. I think it was about $18 million to try to give some after-school programs. Have you seen any sign of good programs that have emerged helping the young people? Um, well, I know Ms. Felice have a, uh, something coming up um, at the church on April 1st right. um, for the kids. And um, a day before that, I believe on the 31st of March, something else. So, I mean, I've seen things slowly but surely setting in. Um, we also have the Camp Junior, you know, so things are slowly but surely starting to um, pick up. Summertime is coming, so hopefully we see a lot more, which will be greatly appreciated because we don't want to see that money go to waste or seeing, seeing nothing done at all. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I believe things are going to start coming to the positive mm -hmm. and a lot of the negative will decease. We can only hope. If we show the photos again of the suspects in court, I want to point something else out about how they look now. They look a little different, some of them. None of them have their hair dyed anymore. Right. Obviously, they're not getting access to dye in jail. One of them, Manuel Rivera, I believe, is the one who allegedly dyed his hair bleach blonde right. uh, before he fled uh, to, I think he was in New Jersey when he was picked up. And I had done one of my Mary Murphy file reports and showed him actually in the hair salon chair when he was getting his hair dyed. Yeah. So th there is a lot of evidence in the case. Some of it has already come out. Obviously, some has not, because today we did really hear some major testimony that yeah. I know I wasn't aware of. I didn't know Diego Suero had you, identified these guys. Do you have your Facebook photo on that as well, the Facebook photo that you put up? Which Facebook with photo? Guys, with all four of them? No, that we have five, there were five of them today, but one of them was leaning back okay, because, when we were in court. Because on the photo that you put on Facebook, you actually see Jose Munez with his middle finger up, if you zoom in very closely. Oh, he kind of put his finger up, no, yeah. No, he did. He didn't he, kind of, he did. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> he, was, he was at the, near the end. He wasn't the last one, right? The closest one was Jonah Kai. Right, he was Martinez the Estrella right. and Moniz, Moniz was second. His hair's a little shorter now. Right. So we, we still have a lot of people watching and, you know, making comments, um, you know, the, the comments go by quickly. 
Tatwaza Mabuhu said, things are not going to come to a positive. Some people are not hopeful, but you, you have gotta, to keep hope. Yeah, you got to keep hope alive. You got to be hopeful. Because certainly Junior's family is hoping for justice. a better future. Mm -hmm. Aside from justice, they yeah. want a better future for other young people in the Bronx. You know, um, one thing to note as well, court um, was supposed to be continued tomorrow right. um, for 9.30. Um, yes. I was told by a court officer towards the end that it has been adjourned until Thursday. It's not going to resume until Thursday, and I will double check on that. And I mean, I, I, I can get certain things confirmed at this right. point, but it's harder because of this gag order. And when I wrote about the gag order on Instagram today, some people were very offended that a gag order was imposed on Junior's parents, on his mother and father, as well as everyone else. And, you know, they said she has a right to speak up for her son. You know, she just made that brief statement before. Yeah. But because so much evidence has actually come out already, I guess the prosecution in its efforts to get a, a non-tainted jury hmm. wants to limit what comes out now. Right. And certainly it's the, really the judge. Judge Robert Neary is presiding over the case. And uh, he allowed us to take some still photos for a couple of minutes this morning. Well, actually this afternoon because this started after 3 o'clock. And after that, you know, that was it. And what I hear is that when the trial actually starts in April, there may only be audio allowed, sound, of the opening statements from the defense and the prosecution, and then we may not, uh, and no cameras, and then at the end of the trial, we may only be able to record with audio the closing statements, which is sort of similar to what happened in that uh, Karina Vetrano case in Queens, another high profile case. So, you know, as we wrap up, I guess we'll uh, show Diego Suero one more time, because really that to me was the biggest bombshell that came out today. Um, Detective Oscar Rosa from the Bronx Homicide Squad testifying that Diego Suero made numerous statements on July 3rd when he was at the precinct, the 48th precinct, uh, basically saying that he was the boss of the Chouray set, uh, which is allegedly part of the Trinitarios gang, mm -hmm. and that he had knowledge of this attack on 15-year-old Junior, and that there was a meeting at his house before and after the murder but that he wasn't at the murder. What's interesting to note, though, is that this is a pretrial hearing, and defense attorneys, it's their job to make sure that some of this kind of evidence or testimony does not get into the trial before a jury. That's what they're going to attempt to do anyway. Okay. So the, the trial, pretrial hearings resume this Thursday, as far as we know. Of course, you can follow us on Pix11.com, and my Mary Murphy mystery page is where I put all the Oh, the junior updates. I have an Instagram page as well. Emmett has an Instagram page. So a lot of people are updating on this case. There's such high interest in the community, and, and I thank you for following us since last June. It, it's such a tragic case, but uh, we try to respond to what the community wants in terms of information and to update you as often as possible when it's warranted. And I have to say, when you're standing in a hallway for six hours, I was at the verge of thinking nothing was going to happen today. But I waited, even if it was going to be a five-minute hearing, I wanted to hear the trial date, you know, if that yeah. was going to be set. Thank goodness I stayed, and thank goodness you stayed, right, yeah. Emmett? Yeah. I'm here until the end. You, you're here until the end. I'm here for every day. All right, every we'll show days. some more pictures of Junior, and, and I, I'll say good night um, as we once again resolve that we are going to follow this case through. And even though there are no cameras in courtroom, we'll do our best to keep on top of any development. And we'll be back there later this week. So once again, I thank you, Emmett, for coming from the Bronx. I mean, we be, I kind of got here, I was lucky, no rush hour traffic. I didn't leave until five o'clock. So it's amazing I got here as soon as I did. And I thank you so much for coming. And well, I, thank thank the, I thank the viewers. Thank you for your support of the community. And this case, I'm greatly appreciated. We're all greatly appreciated. Thank you for being here for us. Well, I appreciate the community of reaching out to me and sharing what they know about the case. If they have any tips, they've sent it to me on Facebook or Instagram. So, Because you're our number one source. I'm the number one source? You're our number one source. Okay. Yes. <laughs> thank you so much. You're I appreciate welcome. that kind of uh, vote of confidence. And I thank the viewers for being here this evening. And uh, we'll probably have more later this week when the case resumes. Thank you again. Good night.